Hello and welcome. This is the uh, seventh day Sunday after Pentecost for 2021, and uh, you've uh, tuned in to our uh, sermon and short uh, prayer service. So, um, of course, uh, you're welcome to join us for a full live service tomorrow with all the songs and things. It'd be a special one. We have uh, two baptisms tomorrow. So, looking forward to that. And um, so, but uh, for today, our, uh, or for this week, our, our readings, our Old Testament reading from Jeremiah chapter 11, verses 18 through 20, and then uh, still reading through James, the book of James chapter 3, starting at verse 13 and into chapter 4, verse 10. And then in the Gospel of Mark, again in chapter 9, verses 30 through 37. Our hymns here at Zion are uh, uh, Loving Christ is Strong and Living from Lutheran Service Book, hymn number 706. And then 851, Lord of Glory, You Have Bought Us. And, uh, and then our closing hymn here, 725, Children of the Heavenly Father at uh, Bethel will sing... Uh, Shepherd of the Tender Youth from the, the, the Lutheran Hymnal number 628. And our children's hymn, uh, Good Baptism, uh, part uh, Father Welcomes, hymn four, 605 in Lutheran Service Book. So, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Let us pray. O God, whose strength is made perfect in weakness, grant us humility and childlike faith that we may please you in both will and deed, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Or uh, the Gospel lesson, hopefully you at home uh, have taken a few minutes to uh, to open it up and look at it, uh, Mark chapter 9, 30 to 37. It has uh, kind of two parts. Uh, the first part is Jesus' second prediction of his betrayal, death, and resurrection. And you can't get much more succinct or clear than this. Just one sentence that says, The uh, Son of Man will be betrayed into the hands of men, uh, will suffer, die, and then on the third day rise again. That one sentence tells the whole story of what's going to happen, doesn't it? What's coming up. But the disciples did not understand what he was saying. And so, they, they were afraid. Afraid to ask. Nervous, maybe. Um, it doesn't make sense. Right? Uh, have you ever been there? <laughs> maybe in a class? or at work, or sometime when you're completely a bit lost. Uh, uh, in class, you might have a teacher trying to teach you something, explain something to you that you are so confused, you don't even know what questions to ask or try to understand. Uh, I had a class like that, probably more than one, but one in particular was uh, uh, for a forestry class, computer modeling tree of the forest. And we learned many different models that were good for different things. And the professor was quickly trying to explain the, the intricate math, the complicated calculus involved in each computer model and, and the you know, what, what they were, you know, what the, each one's strengths and weaknesses were. And they was writing it out on an overhead projector I, uh, yeah, and then quickly scrolling the roll of acetate to a clean sheet to keep going with his notes. <laughs> uh, now, for some of you don't remember or don't know overhead projectors, maybe they're be after your time or maybe they're before your time. But um, but uh, the, you know, in the old days, they might have used a blackboard or something. Uh, I, I've seen that in movies, teachers. Uh, writing with one hand and erasing with the other, trying to keep up. Uh, today, what do they use today, teachers, in a lot of schools? Well, they might use slides, you know, like PowerPoint, which comes from the old slides, but uh, 
kind of like overhead projector, but uh, PowerPoint or um, or uh, um, they have uh, uh, the whiteboard instead of chalkboard, or um, or uh, <clears throat> another thing I've heard of is the smart board, which combines an overhead projector and a chalkboard. You can kind of do both on the same screen. And so for if you uh, for the little ones out there, you're still in school. Does your teacher ever? Uh, is ever putting up some stuff and then quickly you know, taking it off, erasing it or whatever, moving on before you had a chance to read it all or write it all down. Um, so that's what it was like uh, in this class for me. And uh, most forestry students go into forestry for one, not just one reason, but uh, one important reason is that most of us don't want to do math, especially calculus. You know, we don't want to be engineers or, or something more complicated. And um, so we were frustrated. We were all pretty lost. The whole class uh, was. And instead of talking to the professor, I mean, like I said, we didn't even know what kind of questions to ask. We were all kind of lost in this thing. What are we learning this? Why? Uh, why do we have to know the math? Just teach me how to use it. Um, so rather than talking to the professor, um, we made a petition out to the dean of the forestry school, like the professor, and, and, uh, I mean the principal in, in a grade school or high school, and we were asking, trying to ask for a different teacher or something, you know, uh, something we could understand a little better. Well, the professor found out about this and he wasn't real happy either. When he, <laughs> uh, so he sat down with us and we talked things out and we tried to we tried to do a better job of letting him know when he was moving too fast and we needed him to slow down. Uh, and we tried to do a better job of asking questions about, um, especially, what do we use this for? What, why, do we, why should we know this? Um, and I think that was a lot like what the disciples did when they didn't understand what Jesus was saying uh, uh, about being arrested, dying, and then rising again. They were so confused about this, you know, saying to each other, you know, I mean, they, that's, Jesus is their best friend. Who would arrest Jesus? Uh, or why would they kill him? That's just kind of crazy. Maybe he's talking about somebody else? Who is this son of man? Rising again? Dead people don't rise again. That's the craziest part of all, right? <laughs> and you can just imagine the disciples. Hey, you ask him. No, I don't want to look stupid. Somebody else might know what he's talking about. You ask. Not me. I'm not going to ask. And so, as they're confused, uh, rather than trying to figure out what Jesus is saying, they go on to talk about something entirely different. <laughs> and, you know, as is maybe obvious to us, in hindsight, just about the obvious thing of what Jesus was trying to teach them, right? Who, who's the greatest? Well, that's me. I, I drove out demons. I prayed this prayer. I did this. I did that. I followed Jesus. I was the first. He called me. Um, uh, kind of like I said, the way that I and the other forestry students couldn't understand what our professor was trying to teach us, we thought that we were pretty good forestry students because uh, some of us had already had jobs, you know, summer jobs in forestry. We worked in the woods last summer, so we thought we knew what we needed to know. Just let me get out of school and get out to work. Computer models and math was not you know, on, uh, you know, on our list of things we wanted to know about chainsaws and axes, those were more what we knew, what we liked to talk about, what we were interested in. And still today, I, I don't miss calculus at all, but I still like chainsaws and axes. Uh, so Jesus has to show them some other way, to get their attention, to shame them a little bit, probably like my grade in that class, I can't remember what it was exactly, but I don't remember a lot. Um, that he is the servant of all. And he would give them another very memorable and shameful reminder of this same thing on the Last Supper when he washed their feet, he, uh, taking the role of the lowest servant, which any of them could have done, but they all thought they were too dignified, too important for a job like that. They weren't going to lower themselves to wash everybody else's feet. But Jesus' his whole life, from his birth, his teaching, his arrest, his suffering and death would, were all in service to you, to all of mankind. 
He was lived the perfect life that you can't. And, and in your place, he took your punishment, even dying in your uh, in your place, and rise it again. And we, as we heard during our, during the baptism that we'll have tomorrow morning, uh, Romans chapter five. In baptism, we are joined to him. His sins are buried in his tomb, and we are rise with him like Easter Sunday. His resurrection is our resurrection. Uh, he earned our eternal life and gives it to you as a free gift. So we follow his example, and we serve others, particularly those weaker than us. Yeah, uh, I mean, if you serve somebody higher than you, you're hoping to get noticed and try to help that they might lift you up. But serving the weaker, and who needs more help than children, especially infants? Now, there's stories in history about human children being nursed and raised by animals. Uh, such as Romulus and Remus being raised by the wolves. Romulus and Remus were the twin brothers who uh, grew up to found the city of Rome. At least this is the story, the legend, uh, before it was an empire. And in this myth, they were abandoned by the order of their king. And they survived by being nursed by a wolf. But, <laughs> uh, but if you think about it, that's impossible. Human infants are so helpless, so much more helpless than, uh, than wolf pups uh, or deer or some other wild animal. Those can walk and run almost immediately after being born. Human babies take years before they can walk, right? Almost, well, usually almost two years or run or do, you know, do very much to take care of themselves. Uh, so a wolf couldn't raise a human child. <laughs> Wolves just you can't put up with that. Humans are too helpless. Uh, so when we take in the helpless, like children, but also others who are also weaker, uh, and, we do it, and when we do it in the name of Jesus, then we are receiving Jesus and his Heavenly Father. Uh, and not just taking them in without, you know, and not being in the name of Jesus, but uh, in the name of Jesus. And baptism is a, a good start to that. We brought into the name of Jesus. Uh, welcomed into his family, and then teaching them about Jesus, uh, 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 and that he lived and died and rose again for you, and that he was a servant to you, teaching you, to, uh, and then teaching these children to serve others. Even friends and strangers should know we are believers. We can even simply welcome them. Well, hello in the name of Jesus. Hello. Uh, uh, I mean, you know, it sounds a little, a little crazy, but uh, that, that would certainly show who we believe in, who we trust in, who our Savior is. Uh, now, so children in Jesus' day were not very highly valued, uh, even less so than today, because, well, as we said, they're helpless, at least for a few years, sometimes for decades, right? So many children died, infant mortality was high, birth rates were high until recent history. But in, in the Roman and Greek society, well, uh, like our society, which is imitating those cultures, ancient cultures, adult life is much more highly valued. And, uh, <laughs> right, family, children, not so much. And children are becoming less and less important in our own culture. And you, many adults these days don't want to be bothered with children. And with modern medicine, they don't have to be. And some are realizing too late that they miss out on the opportunity. One of the greatest opportunities in life to be a parent, to the gift of life, the miracle of life. And so, uh, I know that those of you watching and here at our church, we want to in welcome children. We, we are so blessed to be able to baptize. It'd be nice to do a few more. And, and it'd be nice to have a Sunday school and a VBX, and we should be trying to be ready when we get the opportunity to do those things. Welcoming little children in Jesus' name. Uh, but there's others who are 
are weak also. Uh, we are all weak in God's eyes, helpless to save ourselves. So, uh, in that sense, especially unbelievers, whoever we welcome, receive in the name of Jesus, is a little child. And whenever we, we receive them in Jesus' name, we're not just uh, receiving, welcoming them, we're also receiving, welcoming Jesus and His Heavenly Father, our Heavenly Father. The peace of God that surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us, uh, let's pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And we'll confess our faith in the triune God. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, who, uh, from where he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you for joining us again today. And uh, as I said, um, we'd be happy to have you join us for our full worship service, or, uh, or even in person, if you're, if you're close by or passing through Grand Coulee, Washington. Now may uh, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.